You're listening to TIP. On today's show, we talk about a subject that so many people want to master, but so few understand where to start. The topic of today's show is creativity. Now, you might be asking yourself, how can I develop the right idea at the right time? And today's guest is one of the leading experts in that field. Now, this might be hard to believe, but Alan Gannett is only 27 years old. But as soon as you hear this interview, you won't believe the amount of knowledge and insight he has into this topic. In fact, at age 24, Alan was selected onto the Forbes 30 under 30 list. Additionally, he's created a highly successful business in the field of big data analytics. For the research of this book, he interviewed a billionaire, one of the wealthiest members of Congress that created three highly successful internet startup companies, the CNBC host, Andrew Ross Sorkin, and many, many other people. So without further delay, I'm really excited to bring you this discussion with the highly intelligent and creative guru, Alan Gannett. You are listening to The Investor's Podcast, where we study the financial markets and read the books that influence self-made billionaires the most. We keep you informed and prepared for the unexpected. All right. So here we are with Alan Gannett. And Alan, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to be with us. I'm really pumped to talk to you about your new book here, The Creative Curve. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. All right. So Alan, you uh, the, the title of the book is The Creative Curve. And you go into quite a bit of detail describing what this curve is. And I find this quite fascinating. Can you give the audience a, just a, a quick overview of what the curve is that you're talking about? So the creative curve is my rebrand of a concept in psychology called the inverted U-shaped relationship between familiarity and preference, which would be a terrible title for a book. And so I rebranded the creative curve. And basically what this is, it's a diagram that represents the relationship of what drives human taste and preference. So we think that human taste and preference is this very organic, nebulous thing that how the heck could we ever figure it out? But it actually turns out there's really good science on what drives us to be interested in certain things and to like certain things but dislike other things. And it all comes down to these two sort of primal urges we have. On one side, we crave things that are novel. This is sort of intuitive. We like new sources of food, new sources of pleasure, reward, and This goes back to our hunter-gatherer days. We're trying to find that next berry to eat, that next meal, whatever it was. That kind of makes sense. So we like things that are novel and new. But we also have this other urge, which is seemingly contradictory. We also have this urge, where we also pursue the familiar. And the reason why is that we're scared of things that are unfamiliar. Think about if you were a cave dweller and you saw a cave that you had never, ever slept in before in a cave you've slept in multiple times, you wouldn't go into the cave that you've never slept in before, you would go into the cave you slept in before because it's safe, you know you're not going to get harmed. And so this seems like a contradiction. We crave things that are novel for potential reward, we also seek out the familiar for safety. And so it turns out that this contradiction is our brain's really elegant way of balancing risk and reward. The things we like, the things we're interested in, are actually a blend of the familiar and the novel. They're familiar enough to be safe, but novel enough to be interesting. And so this is why you find the most successful creative ideas actually aren't the ideas that are radically new. Think about the first Star Wars was a Western in space. Harry Potter is literally like a very standard orphan rising story, but there's wizards. You know, the iPhone was an iPod with a phone, right? And so what you see when you look at actual creative achievement, while we have this notion that breakthrough ideas are radically new, the reality is we don't actually like those ideas. Think about the segue. That did not work, right? We like ideas that are more incremental. And so the creative curve is this curve-shaped relationship is when you first experience something, you tend not to like it. But then when you start experiencing more and starts to feel safer, you start liking it more and more till it gets to a certain point, we start to get bored of it, it becomes cliche, and then the more you're exposed to it, the less you like it every additional time you're exposed to it. So think about when you hear that like new Drake song, like the first time you're like, what is this? 
And then the third time, you're like, oh, this is pretty good. And the tenth time, you're like, nice for what? Can this stop? And then the 15th time, you're like, this has got to stop. And so you see this sort of turtle shell, this sort of upside down you relationship, which again is the inverted you relationship between familiarity and preference, aka the creative curve. So I like this because uh, you talk a lot about the Beatles in your book. Mm. And you also provide a great example of how the how the Beatles kind of rode this curve and they went back and did a bunch of research. Tell, tell our audience about this research. So there's this really cool field in academia of empirical musicology, which is literally the math behind music. And this one professor did this study that I thought was so fascinating. And you know, his basic question was, when you think of the Beatles, you know, they were popular. I mean, they've been popular forever, but they had 10 years of sort of product productivity. And throughout those 10 years, they were popular almost the entire time. And they shifted styles and they had all this stuff. And what was so interesting is he mapped down on a chart the number of experimental song features they used across time. And what he found is it followed this U-shaped relationship. They did these gradual shifts. So they started very mainstream pop. And then they started adding on new and experimental song features. And then as their audience started to get used to those, that's when they started to change again. So really when we talk about creative genius, what we're really talking about is this ability to consistently, not just once, not be a one-hit wonder, but consistently create ideas that are that right tension of the familiar and the novel. And so the second half of the book is really breaking down, well, how the heck do you do that? Because I think when we talk about creativity, we really obsess over the technical skills component of creativity, like how do you create something technically competent? But actually the more impressive feat is, well, how do you get the timing right? How do you develop that right idea at the right time? That's the thing that really is the domain of the so-called creative geniuses, but that's also learnable. Alan, if you don't mind sharing the story about Paul McCartney and how he wrote the song yesterday, I think a lot of people are familiar with this epic song and that he talked about how it came to him in a dream and perhaps a lot of people are just cursed and saying, well, if I don't have the same dream as Paul McCartney, how can I write the same song? So I think you have a really interesting take on this in your book. I would love if you would share that with the audience. So the Paul McCartney story is one of the ones that really I just think is hilarious in the sort of creativity mythology. So the first half of the book is sort of like a Mythbusters around some of the stories and histories and creativity. And one of the stories I start the book with is the story of Paul McCartney and the creation of the song Yesterday. So Yesterday is the most recorded song of all time. Paul McCartney is the number one songwriter of number one singles. He beat out John Lennon. And what's interesting is there's this famous story that you know, Paul McCartney, one morning, he woke up and he realized he had dreamed this melody that went on to become the song Yesterday. And sort of the shorthand version is Paul McCartney dreamed up yesterday. Wow, aha moment, creative genius, brilliant. But what's so funny about the Paul McCartney story is that we have this takeaway from it of, wow, you know, inspiration strikes certain people. You know, they're just divine. You know, he literally just does this in his sleep. Look how easy it is for him. But... The truth is so far from that. The truth is he dreamed up six notes, and we can talk more about where those six notes came from. He dreamed up six notes, and then he proceeded to spend 20 months perfecting the song. He was so obsessed with getting this song right that literally all of the other Beatles, his managers, they would like be doing tours, and he'd be working on the song backstage and be like, please stop, Paul. Like, you got to stop. And in fact, the other thing I think is funny is that, you know, yesterday is known very much for these sort of haunting, brooding lyrics. But the 20 months that he took to actually write the song, the lyrics were all the way at the end. For a long time, he had no idea what the lyrics should be. It's just this idea that this was some magical epiphany moment that you know, led to you know, this boom, this blockbuster success. It's just wrong. Yeah, that, I, I find it really fascinating. And when you were when I was listening to this, because I listened to the audio book on my runs and, and when classic were, podcast host, <laughs> same things. and whenever uh, I, I heard that, I was like, wow, this just makes so much sense. And, and it's so easy for people to just buy into the idea that creative creativity just hits you in a storm. And then that's the end of it. But when you're describing all these other steps that took place in the song, it was it was kind of like, wow, yeah, I I see where he's coming at with with this. This really makes a lot of sense. Uh, there's another interesting uh, person character that you talk about in your book. His name is Jared Paulus. 
and <laughs> and he's a uh, member of Congress, one of the wealthiest people in Congress. Tell us tell us the story of Jared, and then more importantly, how did you how did you decide that you wanted to interview him? Like, why did why did he come about in creativity for you? So, Jared is this really interesting character. He is, depending on the year, the first, second, or third richest member of Congress. He's actually right now the front runner to be governor of Colorado this year. And so his primary is the day we're recording this. So we'll see what happens. Listeners, you, you will know more. And um, But what's interesting to me about Jared, and one of the things, so in the book I interviewed 25 living creative geniuses. And these, I tried to be really eclectic. So these are folks like Pasek and Paul, the songwriting duo who did Dear Evan Hansen, The Greatest Showman in the Lyrics of La La Land, uh, Alexis Ohanian, the founder of Reddit, Jose Andres, the Michelin starred chef, Nina Jacobson, the producer of The Hunger Games. And I tried to go for people who showed that they were able to have success multiple times over. So I wanted to avoid the sort of luck factor. And so Jared's really interesting because Jared, when he was um, an undergrad, started a company, sold for like $25 million. Then in the first dot-com bubble, he started Blue Mountain greeting cards, the first sort of viral online like product, like people would send these greeting cards to each other. He sold it for $900 million in stock and cash. And then he started Pro Flowers, which we all know. So these are like wildly different businesses. His first business was an ISP. And so it was so interesting to me. And then he successfully started a charter school system and he successfully ran for Congress and you know, maybe he's going to be the governor of Colorado. And so what was interesting to me about him and all the people I interviewed was how did he do this over and over and over again? And what I thought was really interesting is that when you look at what these great creatives do, so much of it is about pattern matching. And it's not as much about the fact that, you know, they learned something in school once and this, you know, had this big impact and they were, you know, doing this thing. It's that they were really, really good at recognizing patterns and recognizing when there were metaphors. So for Jared, for example, he was seeing that, wow, a lot of businesses on the internet were becoming successful by you know, disintermediating, taking out the middleman. And when you look at flowers, you saw, oh, wow, there's this entire crazy supply chain. Could you build a better business? And it turns out the answer is yes. The result was pro flowers. They sold for $400 million after it went public. So this to me is really interesting. This to me is really interesting that there's these people who are able to do this again and again. And that tells us something. That tells us there's more than luck involved. So in one of our previous episodes, uh, Preston and I have been talking about this book outlined by Mark Gladwell and where he talks about the 10,000 hour rule in terms of repeated successes and how that is applicable to uh, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs and other extremely successful people. And reading through your book and how it debunks that myth, let's call it that, as the gold standard for being successful in any field. And it's especially interesting because you even interviewed the, uh, the researcher behind the study. So please first explain what the rule is and then what you realized after interviewing the, uh, the researcher. So, lovely listeners, your host is doing a great job of trying to get me in trouble, which is okay. It's okay. I'm here. We're for here for it. So, basically, Malcolm Gladwell wrote in his book, Outliers, of this 10,000 hours rule, this idea that with 10,000 hours of practice, you can become world-class at anything. And this is literally one of the most well-known business mantras of all time. You know, I literally last night did a book talk, and I asked the audience how many people have heard of it, and every single hand in the room went up. Like, it is well-popularized. And here's the issue. It's based on research by a professor named Kay Anders Erickson. He wrote the book Peak. He's a really well-known researcher in talent development. Well, let me just tell you the quote he gave me that I put in my book, which is that, quote, Gladwell misread our paper, period, unquote. <laughs> Ugh. And here's the problem. There's two major problems. <clears throat> One is that what the research said was that it wasn't 10,000 hours. You know, there isn't some magic cell in your brain, some switch that when 10,000 hours goes on, it goes, oh, world class. 10,000 hours was the average across skills. The average. So, like, becoming a world class piano player these days, these days takes about 25,000 hours because so many people try to do it. People started so young. They've been doing it for hundreds of years. So, there's just a higher bar versus there's now these people who 
do like competitive digit memorization, which is like a thing. Like how many digits of pi can you memorize? And that takes only about 400 hours to become world class at. And it used to only take 80 hours because so few people do it. And so the skill and the amount of people, the sort of social construct around the skill, has a huge determinant on what it takes to become world class because that's a relative subject line, right? And so this is just like a very, very big problem with it. But then the second issue is actually bigger. The second issue is that all of Erickson's research is all about something called deliberate practice, which is totally different than just pure practice. See, the difference is practice is about getting something into your rote muscle memory and making it unconscious. Like if I don't like speak sports that well, so like, you know, let's see how I do. But like if you wanted to practice basketball, you play a game and, you know, you'd get better and you'd, you know, your muscle memory and you'd sort of, you'd be able to be less conscious as you do it, blah, blah, blah. But that's not actually going to make you better. What makes you better is deliberate practice, which is taking a macro skill and breaking it down to these tiny little micro skills and doing those skills over and over and over again so that you can get that down. If you ever take golf lessons, let's, they might focus an entire week on just your grip. In basketball, it might be let's do mid-court left-handed dribbling. It's these little micro skills that allow your brain to actually avoid automaticity and stay conscious. It's the complete opposite of practice. And you know, this is why, for example, you know, um, you know, if the 10,000 hours rule made any sense, we'd all be NASCAR drivers because we'd driven our car for 10,000 hours. But that's clearly not true. If we wanted to become NASCAR drivers, we would focus on very small skills in that skill set, like you know, sharp, high-speed, left-handed turns. So, Alan, you talk about genius in your book and people that are labeled geniuses. And I also find uh, kind of a contrarian point of view for this, and I think it might surprise people kind of how you, how you view this. So talk to us about geniuses and, um, and how it relates back to creativity as well. So this capital G idea of genius is very, very popularized these days. I mean, you see this with, you know, the cover of Fast Company, there's these people, they're, you know, they're geniuses, there's these creative geniuses, Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, you know, blah, blah, blah. But the problem is that when you actually look at these stories, what you really find are really stories of significant amounts of effort, significant amounts of talent development, going back to this idea of purposeful practice. I mean, Mozart, I think, is the best example. Mozart. If you watch the movie Amadeus, which won eight Academy Awards, Mozart in that movie is portrayed as blindfolded playing the piano for the Pope at the age of three. And he, you know, wrote his first concerto at the age of four. That's what the narrator says. Um, you know, in the whole movie, you know, the whole idea is that him and Salieri are these arch nemesis, and and Salieri eventually kills him. Spoiler. And you know, Salieri is talking about he sort of opens the movie with you know Mozart wrote a first concerto at four, opera at six. He never had second drafts. He never had mistakes. Oh my God, where do we start? So this is like completely, completely nuts. The real story of Mozart is basically the story of helicopter parenting. So when he was three, his dad said, um, little Mozart, I love you, but you need to become a great musician. And little Mozart was like, whatever you say, dad, please love me. And Mozart's dad, who was kind of rich, hired for him the best music teachers in all of Europe and made this little kid practice three hours every single day, seven days a week. He then wrote his truly first original piece of music when he was 17, not four, which first of all, it's not very good. Second of all, this is after 14 years of practicing three hours every single day with the best music teachers in all of Europe under the conditional love of a helicopter dad. So like, yeah, like you'd write a half decent concerto too. And the story of Mozart is even crazier because you know, this idea, for example, the him and Salieri thing is funny because Salieri was actually friends with Mozart. He, like, was the music teacher for Mozart's kids. This idea that Mozart would never have second drafts and he would always compose in his head, that comes from a letter that was published in 1815 in a music magazine, um, supposedly from Mozart. Like, the music magazine publisher forged it to sell copies. So, like, we have these sort of notions of these mystical qualities like Mozart popped out of the womb playing the piano and it's just wrong. The reality is when you look at the stories of creative genius with even a mildly skeptical look, 
It's really the story of lots of hard, thoughtful, intentional work. Not just hard work, but thoughtful hard work. Yeah, it's awesome. I really, really enjoyed this uh, section in your book. Another thing I really like about this book is whenever you talk about aha moments, you know, moments that I think we all have had, but we don't necessarily know why it's happening right there and that at that time. And you have this very interesting explanation of what is happening in your brain as you're experiencing that. So could you please elaborate on aha moments? So you know, this is usually the part where if I was talking to someone about the book and I was talking to them about Paul McCartney, they'd go, yeah, but like Paul still dreamed up at least part of the song. Like that's impressive. And here's the thing. It's actually pretty normal. So basically when we talk about aha moments, what we're talking about is a certain type of mental processing called sudden insight. And sudden insight is what happens in the right hemisphere of your brain. And basically how it works is your right hemisphere is where you store sort of the more distant and metaphorical associations with words or concepts. Think about it as like definition two in the dictionary. And it's also where you connect sort of disparate ideas together. So here's the thing. This sort of processing it all happens subconsciously. And it's only once the idea becomes clear that it sort of pops into consciousness. It goes, aha. And this is the same effect that when maybe you're looking at a crossword puzzle and you suddenly get the answer without doing quote unquote work. This is the same thing that's going on from a biological perspective as what's going on when Paul McCartney has an aha moment. And you know, the analogy I like to give is you know, your left hemisphere, your left hemisphere is where you do logical processing. And this is all very conscious. It's very, you know, you know step by step. You know, if you're doing a math problem, you're aware that you're doing long division. It's not just happening. And so I like to think about it as like your left hemisphere is like in college you had that smart but loud lab partner who was like, okay, guys, we're going to do this, then this, and then this, and we solved the puzzle. Good job, team. And then your right hemisphere is like the quiet lab partner who's like kind of dorky, but like clearly smart. And, you know, one day we'll all work for, and, you know, he's sitting there and he's like working on the problem. And only once he gets the answer, is he like, Hey guys, I got it. And if your left hemisphere, if you know that, if that guy is being too loud, you actually can't actually even hear your, your quiet lab partner. So this is why you experience aha moments, like in the shower or on a run, or when you're taking a long walk, it's not that the shower or your commute is like inspiring. It's that literally your left hemisphere, your loud lap partner has like shut up. Like that's why you experience them then. So what you see when you look at aha moments is they're not magical or mystical. They're actually a pretty basic biological phenomenon. And so then the question is, well, like if they're basic biology, how do we have more of them? How do we actually, you know, can we cause them to happen more often? Because that would be pretty useful. And this is where it gets really interesting. See, the thing that scientists have found is that the thing that's tied to aha moments, well, it's prior knowledge. You know, if you want to connect the dots, you have to have dots to connect. And so what you find, I thought was really surprising, is when you look at these stories of, um, you know, creative genius, we often talk about, these great creators in almost opposition to consumers. There's that really annoying social media meme that's like 90% um, of people consume, 9% engage, 1% create, hashtag hustle. And it's like, oh, and not only is it like stupid, but it's also wrong. Because one of the things I found, one of the four laws I talk about in the book, is that these great creative achievers are actually massive consumers of the creative products in their niche. And they get obsessed. They learn a lot about a little. It's not like social media. It's not a little about a lot. It's a lot about a little. And the reason why is that this sort of deep consumption is what allows them to fill their right hemisphere with all the stuff they need to actually be able to come up with these new ideas. So like Paul McCartney, for example, like grew up in a musical household. His dad was always playing music. He literally played in a cover band for years, right? And so he was constantly ingesting music, and that eventually, yeah, so yeah, he dreams about music and you don't, but that's logical. J.K. Rowling spent her entire childhood in her bedroom in a book. Her parents were always fighting and squabbling, and college, 
she had library finds, she had so many books out. So yeah, when she daydreams, she dreams about characters and you don't, but that's pretty logical. She also doesn't, you know, daydream about new podcast concept ideas like you probably do. And so one of the big mistakes we have when it comes to aha moments is we sort of forget, we're like, where do they come from? Well, they come from the things you've already experienced, you've already consumed. And so one of the things you can do if you want to be more creative is actually consume more. That's so important. I, I love it. And you, uh, you, you've you actually called this the 20% principle, correct? Yeah. So one of the things I thought was really interesting is so when I did these interviews, I found 100% compliance with at some point early in their career, these great creatives had some very, very deep amount of consumption. Like I interviewed multiple novelists who told me some variation of like, I lived near the library and I read every book. And I was like, I got it. I got it. I've heard this before. But then what was really interesting was that this consumption didn't actually stop. So going into their careers, you know, these people are successful, they're busy, but over and over again, when I would talk to them about how they consume, how they learn, I found that the, the average spend about three to four hours every day consuming, consuming three to four hours, which is about 20% of your waking hours. So I call this the 20% principle. It's this idea that these great creatives, in order to stay relevant, actually spend 20% of their time consuming information in their narrow niche to have sort of raw materials for their creativity, right? That's a lot of time. And so I think that's one of the big mistakes we have when it comes to creativity and creative process. We think it's all about the grind. It's all about doing. But so much of it is about laying the groundwork. So, Alan, you you interviewed just a ton of people and really quite fascinating people for this book. I, I'm curious, well, who do you remember the most and what was it that you learned from them that really kind of stuck in your in your memory? So this is, by the way, I'm not um, I'm not pandering to you. It actually was the one billionaire I interviewed. It was David Rubenstein, who, you know, co-founder of Carlyle Group. He's on the board of 25 nonprofits. I think right now he's the chair of Masonian and the Kennedy Center. Like he's been the chair of Duke before, like just like crazy guy. Um, he was the guy who, when there was an earthquake in D.C. and the Washington Monument got cracked, he he paid to fix it. Yeah. And so just like a cool guy. Top of his career, you know, late 60s. And we went and got tea. And what was so interesting to me about David was that he is like one of the nicest but also most curious people. So he's like a recognizable face. And people would come up and like start talking to him. And he was super nice. But he also was always asking questions. Like he constantly was like this vacuum of information. And then even like I was trying to interview him for my book, he started asking me all these questions. I was like, I was like, no, 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 we're talking about you. And he's like, well, let's talk about data and analytics. And I was like, oh my God, this is so stressful. I have a billionaire asking me about analytics. And so that was a theme that I found throughout the book, which was that these really successful creatives are often very, very curious. And the other thing they do I thought was really interesting, and David does this, a lot of them have a lot of young people around them, right? They have this sort of like this need, this understanding that they want to stay relevant. They can't do it all themselves. They're not going to have access to the freshest ideas. Inherently, just because of their sort of power structure, you know, how successful they are, the sort of information they get. And so a lot of them engage in what I call, and a lot of people have called before, reverse mentorship, which is this idea of learning from young people to get these new ideas. There's actually some really cool studies that show the most successful teams are the teams that are a combination of the establishment and the fringe for this exact reason. You get the credibility, the familiarity, and the reputation of those who are already successful, and you get the fresh ideas and the novelty of those who are new. And so David was this like really cool example of that all bundled up into a billionaire. So I'm not even making this up. This is literally my next question, okay? I'm just <laughs> going to read it here to you. Alan, you're a big data entrepreneur. Tell us a little bit about your business and how you went about founding it. So the company is called Track Maven. It's um, about six years old, based in Washington, D.C. It's about 60 people. We work with about 350 big consumer brands, so everyone from the NBA to you know, Saks Fifth Avenue and sort of everything in between. 
And basically what we do is we suck in all of their marketing data from about 25 different digital sources. And we have like dashboards and reporting and all that sort of stuff. But then we also actually give them on top of that, well, what they should do better, how they can actually improve, how can they better tell their story. And so it's that sort of intersection of the left brain and the right brain. And I started it out of, you know, sort of tying it with the book. I started it because I was a marketer. That was what I was consuming. And this was back in 2011, and I saw that, you know, you were seeing all this pressure from marketers to be data-driven, to, you know, use data, but data was inaccessible, inaffordable, and not actionable. And so the whole idea for Track Maven was if you could solve all three of those problems, you know, there was obviously, you know, a market there. And so, you know, we did it, and, and it worked, and, you know, it's fun when you're doing a, a business that's scaling, it's so much of it is about the journey. But you had uh, how many employees? 60, 80 employees, yeah. did you say? Yeah, wow. So, and you're and for people that can't see you, you're very <laughs> young. Are you still well, under 30 years well, old? Yeah, no, I I'm young. I'm under I'm 27. So, I started the company when I was 21 or 22. Um, and so it was definitely interesting cuz like now I feel like I'm more age appropriate, but when I started the company, I definitely like um, had sort of mild uh, panic and imposter syndrome all the time because I was like, oh my God, like everyone's going to realize I'm like 22 and this is all going to fall apart. And what I realized at the end of the day was that, you know, people sort of respect and understand the fact that like, you know, you're the CEO and like, you know, you've built this thing and, you know, investors seem, you know, luckily tech has sort of a bit of a uh, cliche around young CEOs and so investors don't really mind that much. So that yeah. that's good. <laughs> no, it's very, very impressive. Ah, oh, love it. So Alan, this is the last question I have for you. Reading about the interviews you had with these successful people and your own extremely successful story and journey just so far, what are the key takeaways or perhaps rather the different steps the audience could take to become more creative themselves? So in the book, I talk about these four laws of the creative curve. So one of them is consumption. I talk a lot about not just how much you can consume, um, but also how to consume. The other one I talk a lot about is imitation, which is this idea that since familiarity is such a big part of creativity, you know, what you find is that great artists, great creative achievers are after, actually very comfortable imitating those who've come before them. The third one is around creative communities. And the fourth one is around iterations. And so the creative community stuff, I think there's some really actionable and sort of straightforward things in there. So one of the mistakes we make when we talk about creativity is we talk about it as this individual phenomenon. Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, you know, you know these individual people. But the issue is that, well, creativity is a social phenomenon. There's entire human dynamic to it. What we deem creative as a society is what we all agree is creative. And so since there's a social aspect to it, you have to engage other people. And what I found is that these creative achievers, unlike you know, people who aspire to be creative, these creative achievers all build a community of people around them to actually help them with their creative process. And you know, I experienced this obviously with the book where you know, my name's on the cover, but I had an agent, an editor, um, a research assistant, 15 feedback readers, two copy editors, and a proofreader, and a marketing team, a publicist who emailed you about the book, right? And so you know, my name's on the cover, but the creative process is really not just me. I was sort of more of a you know, composer in this process or um, you know, a conductor. And you see this when you start looking back at these stories of creatives, you know, Steve Jobs, well, day one, he had Steve Wozniak. He had a team of people in that garage working with him. It wasn't him alone in a garage in Palo Alto doing this. He had a team. And one of the things I think these great creatives do that I think is very actionable is that they're self-aware about their weaknesses. And they use other people to fill those gaps. I think oftentimes aspiring creatives think, well, I have to do this all myself. And if there's a skill I don't have, well, oh, I just shouldn't do it. Right? I'm not going to be that successful. But the really great creative achievers, they learn what their gaps are and they fill those with other people in their creative community. And that's what helps them become successful. 
they're not scared of their weaknesses. They're aware of their weaknesses. And so that's something that I think anyone can immediately do and immediately get better at. Well, I can honestly say, Alan, this book, it was absolutely fabulous. I'm not just saying that because you're here with us. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I read this before even knowing you, and then I reached out afterwards because it was so good that we just had to bring you on the show. Um, for anybody listening, the name of the book is The Creative Curve, How to Develop the Right Idea at the Right Time. And uh, Alan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Please tell people where they can uh, learn more about you or maybe follow you on Twitter or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, so the book's website is thecreativecurve.com. And you can see, you know, read the preface. Um, you can watch the book trailer, which my very silly four-year-old Corgi appears in. So definitely worth a watch. And you can um, check me out online, alan.xyz. And I'm at Alan, A-L-L-E-N, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day, Alan. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right, guys. That was all the impress that I had for this week's episode of The Investor's Podcast. We see each other again next week. Thanks for listening to TIP. To access the show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. To get your questions played on the show, go to asktheinvestors.com and win a free subscription to any of our courses on TIP Academy. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making investment decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the TIP Network. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.